Good evening from University Park, Pennsylvania, and welcome to the spring 2021 lecture series presentation, Society's Cage, the Shape of Institutional Racism. I'm Dan Marriott, Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture, and I'm excited we can showcase this important work of design, contemplation, and enlightenment. Before we begin, I want to thank those here on campus who supported and encouraged tonight's presentation. Eliza Pennypacker, former head, Department of Landscape Architecture. Andy Cole, interim department head of Landscape Architecture. Patricia Cooker, interim director, the Stuckman School. Stephen Carpenter, Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture. And I'd also like to thank the staff from the department, school and college who were instrumental in making this evening possible. It has been a collaborative effort across the college that represents a broad arc of the design and performing arts, numerous disciplines that can find inspiration from society's cage. I had the opportunity to experience society's cage on the National Mall in Washington during a pleasant evening this past summer. I confess I have been unaware of the installation in my own backyard until my good friend, Professor of Architecture, Dan Willis, brought it to my attention. As my partner and I walked down the mall, it was difficult to see society's cage within the monumental context of architecture and landscape architecture. Then it arose and commanded our attention and focus as we were immersed in a conversation on institutional racism that redefined for two brief weeks the great central axis of the National Mall. Materials, sound, light, proportion, words, movement, scale. Society's cage represents so many of the skills, values, and perspectives we teach and instill within our students in the College of Arts and Architecture. I approached a volunteer from Smith Group that evening about bringing tonight's distinguished speakers to Penn State. To provide some background about our guest, please welcome Jake Tiernan, a fifth year landscape architecture student and our current National Olmsted Scholar, the highest student honor our profession bestows. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dan, for that. Um, my name is Jake. Um, Dan Schroeder, a design principal at Smith Group in Washington, DC, has more than 20 years of experience with unique and complex projects. An advocate for design justice in architecture he is currently leading anti-racism efforts through such projects as Society's Cage, the National Slavery Museum at the Lumpkin Slave Jail site, and Devil's Half Acre Project in Richmond, Virginia, the Hidden Voices Research Grant, the Freedom House HSR, the Universal Hip Hop Museum, and the Crenshaw Redevelopment Project in downtown Los Angeles. Julian Arrington, a graduate of Howard University, is a lead designer and associate at Smith Group in Washington, DC. His focus on community, cultural, and museum design can be seen through projects such as Society's Cage, the National Slavery Museum, the Universal Hip Hop Museum, the Museum of Pop Culture, and the Gilcrease Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I look forward to hearing both of these presenters talk about these important issues, and we'll pass it back to Dan. Thank you, Jake. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Andy Cole, the interim head of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Penn State. Thanks, Dan. On, the, uh, on the behalf of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Penn State, we are delighted to host these two gentlemen and hear their discussion about this really incredible project, um, Society's Cage. We are delighted that they are able to be here with us, and we hope sometime in the near future that the uh, installation can make its way to University Park so that we can see it in person. So on behalf of the department, thank you for coming, and I will pass it along to Dean uh, Carpenter, uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture. Great. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. A big welcome to Dayton and to Julian. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge today being the third day of February, 2021, 
as the third day of African American History Month. Whether coincidence or not, um, it is a, a pleasure and an important evening to have Dayton and Julian join us this month. According to a 2019 article in Insight into Diversity, fewer than one in five new architects identified as a person of color. And African-American women, if you weren't aware of this, comprised only 0.3% of new architects annually. The other design disciplines are comprised of similar demographic numbers. Now, I'm framing that opening with those numbers to speak to the significance and the importance of having Dayton and Julian with us tonight. From what I can tell, from what I've read about both of them since the summer, since professors Willis and Marriott shared with me this amazing work, Society's Cage. From what I can tell about Dayton and Julian, we need more architects, landscape architects, designers, artists, cultural workers in the world like them. Their work is unapologetically informed by the anti-racist perspective. It's grounded in the mode of racial justice and social action inherent to most works of public cultural production that make any kind of positive difference. Much like our relationships with society, works of public cultural production require viewers to become participants in the construction of the meanings they hold, reveal, challenge, and promote. Now, I did not experience society's cage in DC as Professor Marriott did. I didn't get to see it on the National Mall. I've seen many other things on the mall, many other works, many other installations, many, many other experiences. So I'm extremely eager to hear what Dayton and Julian have to say about this work. What I imagine they will share with us, either explicitly or implicitly, will be about its power and its role of provoking reflection in order to reveal something new that we didn't know before. And that statement comes to me from um, Pablo Helguera, his, his work on um, socially engaged art. In their description of the work, Society's Cage in Architect, the Journal of the American Institute of Architects, Julian and Dayton describe Society's Cage like this. And they describe it with many more words than this, but I wanna give you this, this excerpt. The work is a timely interpretive installation born in the aftermath of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's murders as our society reckons with institutional racism and white supremacy. Glad that they use those words, institutional racism and white supremacy. Not that I'm glad that they exist as concepts, but I'm glad that they are being spoken and used publicly so that we can use those phrases as centers of our discourse and dismantle what they stand for and what they do. While the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were vivid markers within the recent past in our society, the United States society, our society has long reckoned with institutional racism and white supremacy. And I just wanna end by saying we are exploring the possibility of having society's cage here with us on the campus at Penn State at University Park. So for those of you who have heard me speak before, you've heard me talk often about questioning the answers as a methodology and a mode of inquiry. Dayton and Julian, their work works this way too. They question the answers. They take what is given, given and wonder and ask and provoke what if, why not, and when. Please welcome Dayton Schroeder and Julian Arrington. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, I'm Dayton Schroeder and I am gonna shift to sharing my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Can you guys hear me? Thumbs up. Awesome. So um, yeah, thanks for having us. Um, it's great being here um, tonight. Julian, Julian and I will talk a little bit about Society's Cage, but before we get started, we just kind of wanted to give you a little brief 
overview and, and, and sampling of, of, of the type of work that we do. We, we are, I guess we've been dubbed artists, but um, our day jobs are, are architects. And so just wanted to kind of give you a brief rundown of our firm. Um, we are the, the oldest AE firm in the country. Uh, we currently have about 15 offices nationwide um, um, and an office in Shanghai as well. We are a, we're a diverse practice, um, you know, with, we have studios that are focused in, you know, cultural work, uh, commercial work, which includes, you know, office, residential, uh, mixed use. We do a little bit of healthcare. We do science and tech, higher education, government work, um, you name it, a full gamut. Um, we're an integrated practice, so, so we're more than just architects. Uh, we also specialize in, in interiors, uh, urban planning, campus planning, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, st structural, civil, in civil engineering. Uh, we do a little bit of historic preservation, uh, lab planning, et cetera. Um, and we also, you know, we place a high emphasis on thought leadership. You know, we, we have experts who focus on, you know, sustainability, uh, you know, education, uh, forensic science. We have uh, exhibit designers. Um, again, you know, this is this is a uh, this is a main part of our practice to focus on on thought leadership. Um, but we also kind of wanted to give you a, a, a flavor of our, our personal work. Um, and if you invite us back one day, maybe we could say a little bit more uh, about this work. But you know, our, our design mantra is design a better future. And that essentially entails, uh, you know, fundamentally the idea, the ideals of, of placemaking, um, storytelling, uh, sustainability, integration, innovation, and design justice. You know, we've been talking a lot of, about design justice recently. Um, and DC Water um, is, a, is a good example of innovation. This is a new, uh, was this 150,000 square foot administrative building um, for DC Water, which is our, our local water utility company? It's the first it's the first commercial application of a sewage heat recovery system in the United States. Um, so, so we're basically using sewage to to heat and cool the building, um, and it's um, currently one of the most sustainable uh, uh, buildings in the country. Uh, Kevin Reichert, um, one of the one of the main engineers on this uh, project, is actually a, a Penn State grad. So I don't know if anyone knows him, but shout out to Kevin. Um, the the Levin Building. This is a neural and behavioral science building um, at the University of Pennsylvania. It's just to me, just it's actually my favorite building and and a great example of of, of place making, you know, branding and, and storytelling embodied in a building. Um, on the boards, we have the, the uh, National Slavery Museum at the Lumpkin Slave Jail um, slash Devil's Half Acre in Richmond, Virginia. This will be a uh, 100,000 square foot uh, uh, museum building to be built around the archeological remains of the, the Lumpkin Slave Jail, which if, if you know anything about the history, um, um, consists of the, uh, a slave jail and a, and a tavern. Um, the, the, the rest of the compound is believed to be buried underneath I-95. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to kind of go on our website or, or to go to Lumpkin, it's lumpkinsjail.org, I believe, is the website that's been set up for this project if you want to learn uh, more about that. And uh, Julian and I have also been working on another important project. This is, this is um, also on the boards the Universal Hip Hop Museum. This will be a 50,000 square foot um, interpretive space um, to celebrate the history and culture of hip hop. Um, it's gonna occupy a portion of the, the ground floor of the Bronx Point development, um, which is located just a few blocks south of Yankee Stadium, just to kind of put it on the map. Um, the project was put on, fun, was put on hold for, mainly for fundraising, but also because uh, the construction of the base building was delayed due to COVID, but this is now we ju we just actually had a soft restart, so we're hoping to get that get the ball rolling on this and 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 and, and get that going pretty soon. And I believe it's gonna we're planning to deliver this in twenty. Don't quote me on it. I think it's twenty twenty three. I'm not sure. Again, I'm I'm still not sure how much of an impact COVID has on that deadline. So so don't hold me to it. But that's that's kind of what what's been said. So. We'll see how that that materializes. And so with that, 
I want to kind of shift focus to, to society's cage, the, the, the reason that we're, we're here tonight, um, and just uh, walk you through the project. Um, Julian and I walk you through the project. So society's cage was, was a, a grassroots effort that, that really kind of was, was born in the aftermath of the, the Breonna Taylor and, and uh, George Floyd murders. You know, we, we wanted to do something to um, contribute to the discussions that were kind of happening in our profession and in our society at large, um, as we all were sort of reckoning with um, this, this, this um, injustice, if you will. I think, you know, we've, we've been conditioned as a society to kind of think of these murders, these police murders as anomalies. And, and oftentimes we kind of see the, the police who are involved as, as sort of bad apples. Um, but society's cage is an objective um, attempt to contextualize um, these murders within the 400 year history of state violence um, in America. We got, we got started um, just after, um, just shortly after the death of George Floyd. And in less than three months, we literally um, conceived of the concept. We became our own client. Uh, we secured a physical site. Uh, we had to fabricate it. Um, we had to build a, a, a fundraising platform, um, a website, and we, we even commissioned a musical soundscape um, for the experience. So it was a lot lot that happened in a very short period of time um, to make this happen. This was a, I like to say, a process-driven design that was where the resulting aesthetic was driven by data. And the data was driven by questions. So the first question that we asked ourselves was, what is the value of Black life? You know, what, what, what societal structures impact Black life? What are, what are its historic patterns? Um, um, you know, what are the racial and gender discrepancies um, inherent in those patterns? How has it manifested or changed over time? You know? And that, that ultimately led us to the institutions of, of, of lynching, mass incarceration, capital punishment, and police killings. So I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Julian to talk a little bit about how the, the concept materialized. You're on mute, Julian, if you're, if you're talking. Yeah, I can see you're on mute. I think you're off. I think Julian's having technical difficulty. Um, uh, I'll just kind of, I'll maybe I'll kind of, maybe I'll kind of just talk a little bit and then see if you could get reconnect somehow. Um, but the the form and the shape of of the pavilion is is literally a, a physical representation of racist institutional structures um, that we like to say have that we like to say have historically acted to to undermine um, justice and fairness in our society. So the, this idea of the, the imperfect cube um, is really a symbol of undue justice and, and harm in our society. And, and the void uh, that you see is a sort of a symbolic representation of the, 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 symbol the systemic, I should say, forces that devalue and compromise black life. Um, the facades of the, uh, Julian, are you on yet? <laughs> I want to talk through your, Yeah, I don't know what's going on. But the, the facades of the pavilion are, are bar graphs of, of statistical data that describe how African-Americans have been impacted by the institutional structures of state violence. So each of the four facades is focused on the institutions of, of lynching, mass incarceration, um, uh, police killings, and, and capital punishment. Um, the ceiling that you see, the, the, the ceiling or the shape of the, the interior hall of the space is sort of an undulating surface that is the result of the convergence of the four interpretive themes. 
So in, in a sense, you can think of the, the, the resultant form as being the, the um, sort of a, a mathematical expression of the four, the four bar graphs um, sort of combined, mathematically combined, triangulated and averaged across the surface of the void to kind of create this, this hole in, that, in, in that, this shape. So in, in, in essence, the, 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 the form that you see is a mathematical expression of, of racism. The, uh, the pavilion is, is really designed fundamentally to teach um, and build empathy. So it's really built around two interpretive layers. Um, the first is an educational layer um, or educational component that's really designed on the outside of the edifice um, to educate the visitor about the history of state violence. So each of the each of the facades, as you as you kind of can see, there's a what I refer to as a skirt that goes around the perimeter, and each facade kind of focuses on one of those indi those four individual themes of state violence. So when you walk up, you get a um, you kind of get a takeaway statement, a, like a, a you know bold takeaway statement. You get a synopsis of each of the institutions in the center, and then yeah. oh, there you go. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Of course, my headset shuts down on me as soon as I uh, get queued on. You want me to pick it up? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. All right. Yeah, sorry about that. Now, so so as Dayton was uh, starting to allude to, uh, it's really about the these renderings are, are kind of an intent to depict the experience through through the uh, or the concept through the imagery in a sense. So even the rendering itself. Uh, was in, was intentionally sort of desaturated and saturated to sort of emphasize the experience in in the uh, in the conceptual in a conceptual manner uh, when we talk about the continuum as Dayton uh, suggested in the previous set of diagrams and how the cube is really uh, uh, designed to to describe a continuous uh, thread of state violence through history. And once you enter the pavilion, uh, we sort of wanted to give the user an experience that was almost threshold like. So once you enter it, uh, it's, it's about reflecting and sort of seeing your context in a different way. So that's why the, the outside is sort of desaturated in contrast, because it's almost a lens. So once you enter the pavilion, uh, uh, you could see that we started to, to allude to these 50 or excuse me, allude to these the lighting above, uh, which alludes to these 50 states, there's 50 lights, uh, and also sort of depicts this idea of, of uh, what do you call it, finding refuge. So if you think about this, the North Star, the stars, and how they sort of led uh, slaves uh, or were used to, to find their way, slaves used it to find their way to refuge and, and uh, or freedom in the North. So there's sort of these these underpinnings uh, or references through there. Uh, we in the process we sort of um, we decided to uh, what do you call it commission these artists or musicians from New Orleans uh, to sort of s assist in the uh, the intent to produce empathy because empathy was sort of the core uh, conceptual uh, underpinning of this of this uh, pavilion. It was empathy and education. So the, the interior, the emotive experience sort of happens in the inside, while the educational experience for the most part happens on the periphery. And uh, later in the presentation, we'll play a video, but, but the, uh, the artists, all we did was send them this, this rendering. And essentially from that, they created four different um, movements through the course of eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, in reference to the murder of George Floyd. And what, what happens is it sort of takes you on a, a journey through the musical or a, 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 what do you call it, a, an audio experience that assists in sort of providing, providing a, uh, uh, an, a sort of insular effect of, of, of being inside this, this uh, oppressive uh, pavilion when you think about the weight uh, in, in sort of conjunction with, with, the, uh, with the audio. And you know, I'll just add to Julian, um, I think the, the another major component in the interpretive experience here um, centered around an activity. We, we encouraged all the visitors, you know, once they 
once they entered the pavilion because because part of the part of the the uh experience on the exterior of the edifice is is largely designed to kind of trigger emotion and kind of you know stir people um and kind of move them emotionally so that when they when they enter the pavilion um what we, what we typically ask our visitors to do or encourage them to do is to hold their breaths for as long as they can um, in reference to the eight minutes and 46 seconds that George Floyd suffered at the hands of police and to, you know, uh, you know, record a short video stating how long they were able to hold their breaths and to provide a few short statements um, on, on how they feel in the moment and to upload um, that video to, to social media to share with friends and family. And the idea in, in essence was, was that we would, we were equipping the visitor or use, you know, equipping them with the agency to, to, to reach out to friends and family and kind of share the message. So, so in essence, the visitor um, sort of becomes, you know, part of the, 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 um, the, 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 the message telling and, 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 and in spreading the, the gospel and, and who better to, who better to have these difficult conversations with friends and family than, than friends and family. So that, that's a, that was also a huge part of the, the interpretive experience, actually drawing people in to take part in this exercise um, and to you know, spread awareness and build empathy through social media. Oh, sorry, Julian. You- no, that's fine. I, was, no, I guess the last thing I could add to that would just be that the floor, the, the floor is uh, actually, the texture that you see on the floor are names of victims of state violence. Uh, so there's almost 10,000 names of uh, different victims of the four uh, types of state violence that, that we took data from and then juxtaposed or, or sort of leading the path through the names uh, is, uh, excuse me, our, our quotes from different luminaires. So different figures speaking on uh, state violence or, or institutional racism. And the intent is to, to, in a a sort of literal fashion, sort of not become one of those names through like these people had, it sort of gives you the, the, uh, the, the, um, what do you call it? In sort of in the, in the, in the shed of the darkness, there's, there's moments of light and sort of uh, the relationship between the lights and the luminaires uh, is is intentionally sort of designed to provide this contrast and, and really show you that sort of in spite of all this weight, how beautiful uh, it must have been for for people to succeed through the path of of, uh, of darkness. And then also keep uh, in the back of your mind, remember this image, because I think there's a photo later in the presentation that has a similar <laughs> uh, similar sort of experience. So shifting to the build, you know, we, um, as I mentioned, I don't know if this, this video is going to start. As I mentioned, this was part of a grassroots effort, you know, from a small group of architects, Julian, myself, and, and, and a handful of others. And we designed this concept before we had any funding or an actual site, you know. You know, we figured we'd go to Home Depot to source materials, maybe ask the firm for a couple thousand dollars and, and crowdsource the labor from office staff and, and any other sort of interested volunteers. Um, we, we literally talked about, initially talked about doing this out of PVC pipe at one point. <laughs> so word, but word got out. Um, we ended up sharing the concept with uh, Smith Group's board of directors. And uh, they were super excited about the potential of the project. And, and, and uh, you know, they basically promised to fund it if we secured a, a, a site. Um, so as, as at the same time, um, we became aware of the 2020 March on Washington, which was set for August uh, 28th. And this was, you know, we were, well, we were deliberating over this and developing the concept in late July. Um, so we figured it would be ideal, if funny enough, to get this installation um, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza. Um, and, um, we actually um, we actually were not able to do that. The 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 administ- you know, you know, we were looking at everything that was happening in the city with the mayor and the emergence of Black Lives Matter Plaza, and and the the the, the just the uh, the level of of uh, just the level of excitement in the in the administration 
Um, so we reached out to the mayor's office and uh, we uh, inquired about their interest in the installation and, and you, know, you know, potentially putting this installation on Black Lives Matter Plaza. They were super supportive, um, but you know, in the end, their hands were tied um, because the city had a hold on all public permits due to COVID-19. But they, they essentially asked us, you know, like, why don't, you, why don't you go talk to NPS, you know, the National Park Service? They don't, they don't have any, any permits, any permit restrictions. They're, they're, they're functioning and they're open and they, they might be able to accommodate you. So we actually reached out to NPS. Uh, they, they actually offered us three sites, one of which was um, this, this site that you see on the National Mall. Um, and I actually don't even remember those other those other two sites, to be perfectly honest with you, because when this site was offered to us, it was like it was a no brainer. It was it was it was like, let's let's do this immediately because this was this is like front and center. Um, and, you know, it's like America's front yard. Right. And um, this 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 site was actually reserved um, for another group um, who who actually decided to pull out because of the confer- concerns over, over safety um, and COVID-19. And that allowed us a window of opportunity um, to kind of fill the void and get in when we got in. So, so kind of what, just to ping on to what Dayton just referenced a minute ago, monument, uh, amongst monuments and being on the nation's front lawn, there's like this image right here sort of shows this beautiful juxtaposition of our installation in the context of some of the most iconic uh, pieces of architecture, excuse me, architecture in America. You think about uh, the Washington Monument uh, to the south, or sorry, to the, uh, in one, I'll just say in one direction, and then uh, west, and then to the east, you have the, the Capitol building, and then flanking, the, flanking it from the other two directions, you have uh, the Trump Hotel, and you have other icons, uh, including the African American Museum, which, uh, when you look at the material sort of comparison, it wasn't intentional, but it's sort of a happy, um, happy coincidence. But uh, really, sort of juxta- juxtaposing itself against icons of democracy, capitalism, and basically all these different sort of icons. Um, so I. There's the Capitol in the background, and you can see um, we were really sort of positioned nicely in the context of the Smithsonian. Uh, that's the castle there on the right. Uh, the previous photo was actually taken taken from the uh, forget the, the the terminology, but basically the peak of the the castle over there. Uh, so this image right here on the left kind of shows uh, the texture of the, the the layer of names that I was talking about before. And you could see how people, as they sort of uh, experienced it, took the time to to read those names and and read the quotes and consume the information around the periphery. So it's really a, a, a experience that requires you to to sit there and and contemplate and and take things in. Uh, so this this image uh, does a good job of of showing the lighting and and sort of the experience through, which leads you from one side, uh, which was the cat, no, actually the monument was in the back, but uh, you can see how the monument sort of was nicely positioned uh, in one direction. Um, so I think, I believe the image on the right was taken the day of the, the march. Uh, it's too bad we don't have the video in here, but uh, we were there on the day of the march and it was really, it was a really powerful moment at the the end of the day where a large uh, a large group of protesters sort of marched by the pavilion. It was almost uh, theatrical in a sense. So another image, I think somebody was laying down there on the left. <laughs> you can kind of see the texture that's created. Uh, there's, there's 484 rods. And you could see how, how the layering begins to, to play into effect. I'd also add to Julian, you know, this was this, unlike most of our projects where we have a professional budget for, for photography, um, was not the case. You know, a lot of our photography 
was sourced from um, volunteers um, and visitors who, who kind of came to the site, were inspired, took photos, then, then shared them. So you'll notice that there's no real consistency in terms of, in terms of style across mm -hmm. the board in the representation of, of photography for the project, that they're very, they're, they're all the photographs are very different. And in a way that, that, that is reflective of the fact that there were so many diverse people who, who took these, these images. And, and I think it's a sort of a poetic, poetic in a sense, because it kind of convey, conveys kind of the, the, the diversity of perspectives and, and, and views and, and, and just, just the different types of people who, who, who came to the site and experienced it um, on the National Mall. And I, even to that point, I think the National Mall well, it was a great site that really worked out in our favor um, in lieu of the Black Lives Matter Pavilion, because I think, um, in, you know, it attracted so much more diversity. Um, not only were we able to get it installed and on the site for the, the you know, the 2020 March on Washington, but it was it just also happened to be the tail end of the RNC convention, right? Uh, to to kind of get Trump reelected for 2020. So a lot of people were in town for, for, the, for that convention and it, and and it it brought it brought a lot of people to the site who really didn't know what it was and it, you'd see them kind of walk up and read our orientation banners that you kind of see in this image here and it didn't kind of look up at the thing and look back down and read a little bit more but you know what was beautiful about it is everyone um you you could you could kind of read people's um sort of uh political ideology just based on their their their, their reaction and their, their you know just their 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 um their expressions um and even even the people who seem to sort of be a little bit uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable about it always came forward um and and kind of inspected it and checked it out and spent time actually walking around and, and reading all the facts and ab really absorbing it and even going inside so it, so it was it was it was beautiful i wish in some ways we had almost took taken video of of reactions of people to just kind of watch how people moved and interacted with with the installation but i'm sorry julian no they're fine yeah these these images right here like you see the police officers uh, taking their time. So we had a number of different occasions where officers came by and, and inspected it or other people, as, as Dayton mentioned, and uh, some people even came to us in a sort of confessional tone where, where they felt like the, the cage cut or the insulation uh, gave them or shed light to them in a way where, where they recognized their complicity, their complicitness with, with uh, racism. And we had some really interesting stories that were sort of a result of, of being here. And I guess part of, part of the experience too, is that, um, or a story too, rather, is that the firm as a whole sort of came behind us and supported us. And part of, part of the agreement or the permit uh, required us to, to be on site 24 seven. So there was somebody there at two o'clock in the morning and even at two o'clock in the morning, one night, uh, Dayton, myself and other members of the team were there and uh, we had people stopping by. And it was almost like at, at, at two o'clock, it was easier for those people to get a moment of solitude and really take in the information and 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 uh, an effect is almost like a, a sanctuary, we like to say. It's like a spirit at night. Yeah, I think the, the 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 darkness kind of afforded a a, a a cloak of comfortability, you know, where people people felt like it was okay to cry, it was okay to shed a tear, um, because you know you you had some level of you, you had more privacy at night, you know, and and it was a more intimate place at night, and also I mean, I've been there on a number of occasions all night and. The, the stream of traffic never slowed down at this installation, which was incredible. I mean, there are people here at four o'clock in the morning. There's some people who came every day. Um, there are people who you couldn't get them to, to, to leave. They would go inside this thing and they would just sit there for an hour. And, and, and so everyone, everyone kind of, kind of dealt with it in their own personal way. Um, and I think it, it, it was definitely, 
very moving for some people to kind of just to see some of the, 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 the levels of, of, of compassion that people had and the things that they would do that were kind of extreme, but just goes to show you the power of it. Shot there. And this is, this is that photo I was talking about before where we, in the rendering, uh, we showed that moment where where the father was was uh, teaching his son about the legacy of of racism, and the rea it's it's a reality for a lot of parents. I, uh, I can't speak from I can't speak for I can't speak on it from experience yet, but uh, I imagine as a parent, um, sort of confronting your child with with the realities of the world, uh, sort of arms them with with the the tools they need to to succeed and combat uh the force that's depicted above uh so the i guess what was it the second week we were there for two weeks so the week a week in uh Dayton, myself and a few others got together and were like wow it'll be it'll be absolutely amazing uh to to see the installation as a stage and give other artists the opportunity to to perform and and speak and a platform for the for them for artists to to project themselves and give people way into their experiences and all different excuse me all different types of art so we had dance we had poetry and it was i thought the dance we'll, we'll show a video of it in a moment was absolutely phenomenal and uh some of the spoken word as well and uh, seeing the artist sort of in context of the cage kind of uh, added, uh, in my opinion, added power to, to their performance. We're just gonna show, this is an eight minute and 46 second video that was recorded. This is, um, the dancer's name is Yari Delancour. She's a trained Alvinelli um, dancer. We, we commissioned her to dance to the, the, um, the soundscape that we commissioned through our, our group of musicians down in, in Tulane. And, um, you know, this was her interpretation of, of the eight minutes. And I'll just do a minute of it, but this, is, this was her interpretation of the eight minutes and 46 seconds that George Floyd suffered. just a short snippet that's actually on youtube uh society's cage yari delancar you can actually check that out if you're if you're interested um in doing that and that was actually that was also the uh the soundscape that we commissioned as i mentioned and what was beautiful about the soundscape when we when we um engaged those guys all we asked them to do was to um create a create a soundscape that would sort of capture the mood and the moment of the eight minutes and 46 seconds that George Floyd suffered. And I think when they saw, when they saw the concept for the pavilion and they realized that we were focusing on the four themes of, of state violence, um, they actually composed that piece in the four parts. So if you actually, if you ever have an opportunity to listen to it, you'll hear the subtle changes 
um, in it. So, so there's a, there's, you know, there's a part that's, that focuses on lynching, another on mass incarceration, another on capital punishment, and obviously another on, on police killing. So it's just another kind of nuance. And also, if, if you notice, the, the bars themselves um, had a lot of uh, movement and swaying, you know, that there, there was some windy days um, out here where you actually um, would see the bars kind of swaying in the wind and occasionally they would, they would clank. And a lot of people, a lot of people were really moved by that sound. We, we actually, Julian and I did not, um, were not so um, brilliant to perceive of the sound of these things clanking together. We, <laughs> we thought about them swaying, but, but just the, the power of hearing the clanking of, 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 of bars of steel if it, it many people was, uh, was almost like a, a reference to, to slave chains. Um, and and, and, it, and in, in many ways just just was one of those un unexpected um, one is one of those just unexpected attributes of this project that we did not anticipate and that we were, we were surprised by but but added a lot of power and strength to, to the experience. Oh I'm sorry Julian did you want to say anything I keep slipping in here No I think Baltimore is next okay. Um, and yeah, so the next site was the Baltimore, the, the War Memorial Plaza in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, this this shot was actually taken um, with our uh, with Mayor Brandon Scott. So you could see me kind of pointing up, Julian um, looking up. We were there for uh, the month of October for for Architecture Month, um, and it's just an incredible site because it's 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 the installation was sited in between um, the the um, City Hall building, um, War Memorial building, and the the police station, um, the the police tower. So again, you know, just 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 a beautiful um, context in terms of the you know sites of power. We are you know we have plans to travel the installation um, around the country. We've gotten interest from uh, uh, some entities or partners in New York, Chicago, L.A., uh, San Francisco. New Orleans, uh, Miami. Um, and we, so we plan to eventually go to all those cities to kind of reach a critical mass. But we also plan to go to sites of conscious like, like Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma, um, which is currently grappling with um, the, the, the reflections on the, on the centennial of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. So we are currently slated to go to Tulsa next. We'll be there in, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Julian, um, is it? It's like it, late May. I think it's yeah, late May. May. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, and we also plan to go to Richmond, Virginia, which was obviously, as you probably all know, was the former capital of the Confederacy and another city that is trying to reconcile with its, its historic past, um, and particularly um, and the Confederate monuments that have been forcefully taken down on Monument Avenue. So um, that's in the works. Um, you know, and, and as I mentioned, you know, ideally we are looking for um, sites of power um, that are, um, have historically, contain historically significant buildings or, or structures or monuments that relate to justice, you know, law, law enforcement, you know, uh, or even black history, um, you know, African-American sites of trauma and resilience. You know, in many ways, you know, we think of the pavilion as a as a lens um, for reframing our views of, of established historical structures um, within the historical context of racialized state violence. You know, it, you know, we want to allow the visitor to kind of see things from the perspective of the oppressed. Um, it's it's kind of a, um, an an ode to um, what's his name, Howard Zinn. You know, it's a Howard Zinn, like, it's like the Howard Zinn approach to history of seeing things from, from the perspective of the oppressed. So here you actually see um, the War Memorial Building, you know, sort of through the lens of, of the installation. What's, and, uh, what's interesting too is, you know, when you talk about the sites and the different sites that we're, we're observing or, or considering and evaluating is a lot of these histories sort of go, go untold uh, to our astonishment, it's amazing how how many people within Tulsa are unaware of the Wall Street, the Black Wall Street massacre, and it's almost you know even even the history in D.C. or wherever it may be, you'd be amazed by how many people 
grow unaware of of these untold truths and and what you discover in the process is really there's there's an intention there's an intentionality behind that and it's it kind of it it, it stalls the healing process so what we're doing here is we're trying to to give people a place to empathize and educate and educate themselves with the premise of beginning to allow people to heal and for us to to reach a place where where you know where we could really have that moment that kumbaya moment i guess everybody sort of harkens on Um, and, you know, as we as we travel the installation, you know, I think there will be, you know, we hope that there'll be opportunities for each city to kind of personalize the content, you know, tell tell local stories, you know, tell tell their account of history. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of the, the power of this installation as well, that as it travels, um, there's a new opportunity to kind of reinvent it um, over and over and over again, um, depending on on. The contextual history um, in which it's located. Just another one, and um, you know, again, um, just the power of 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 you know in of bringing um, other social justice oriented artists um, into the space. Um, we weren't. This was this. Well, I won't. I won't even get into it. But this is Navasha Day um, from uh, the group Fertile Ground, and you know, she came out and. Um, kind of blessed the the installation in Baltimore. I just thought it was was a was a beautiful uh, event. Um, and again, you know, you kind of I kind of forgot to point it out earlier, but again, in these I love these profile shots because you begin to see the data, right? You begin to see um, how those 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 statistical graphs are kind of articulated um, in the architecture. Um, and you know what I like to say um, is, you know, we. We took the ugliness of racism and we, we rendered it in a beautiful way to draw people in to have uncomfortable but, but necessary conversations. Um, and so that, that's what society's cage is, as, as Julian mentioned. It's, it's, a, it's a conduit to draw people in, create awareness, um, build empathy, and, and, and allow for people to kind of to share with, with, with friends and family. Um, this was also part of a, a fundraising campaign. So in addition to um, our, 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 our mission of educating the public, we also um, you know, wanted to have some direct action. Um, so we, we're also partnered with the AIA Architectural Foundation um, and, and, and all the money that we raise goes towards their diversity advancement scholarship program. So that's also a big, a big part of this, this initiative. And um, at some point, I think we have a, a link that we that we share with that donation information. Or if not, maybe we can put it in the chat. So if you know if you know any institutions, organizations, or or, or um, you know anyone who wants to, to to donate, you know, please spread the word and and help us uh, spread the message. If you know anyone who's interested in bringing the installation to a city or a place. Um, my, my contact information is up here. You can get in contact with me and, and I'll work with you on, on next steps to make it happen. And I think that's it, right, Julian? Yeah, just the belt. And also, you can follow us on social media. I was forced to get a social media um, <laughs> account, an Instagram account. Um, um, if you, you kind of want to follow um, the, the installation and kind of know where it's going next and, and how, you know, how, and just try to track it as, it as it travels around the country. And also we are, we also have been getting some interest across the pond. Uh, 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 there's there's uh, an interest in, in either bringing the installation to the UK or, or doing a, um, a clone of the installation um, in the UK, which, which some believe is gonna be cheaper. So we might even have some international um, exposure. Um, I think that's it. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. yes. <laughs> so, Dayton and Julian, thank you very much. Uh, I have to, uh, we have some, we already have a number of questions that have been populating in the chat, which I'm going to ask of you. Um, but before the question, I, I just want to say briefly, it, it's been a pleasure getting to, to know both of you these last months um, in uh, working to have you both here. So I'm so grateful for the, these incredible insights uh, into this, this wonderful work. And I have to tell you, obviously we were hoping we can get the installation to, to University Park. And my students yesterday had a, a huge debate about the most appropriate location on campus, <laughs> uh, which was a fierce, fierce argument uh, among a variety of spots with some very recent ideas about meaning, experience, uh, places that represented points of power, places that represented points of contemplation. So um, I'm excited that this work is already providing some very creative conversation and, and, and introspection in terms of meaning and place and location and design. So um, I appreciate that greatly. Um, so we have a number of questions. Uh, and the first question that we had that came in was, the design and execution came together so quickly. What surprised you most about the finished work that was unexpected from the initial concept? Um, you want me to start with that one, Dane? Uh, I could yeah, just try to allude to my my. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but go ahead. I mean, for me, for me, it was for one thing was the the like you sort of alluded to the process was so brief that. I, I don't think we ever really had the opportunity to to digest or like like typically when you're doing a, a pro like a typical architecture project, you have the opportunity to it's iterative. So you have the opportunity to go back and forth and really you know make make uh, alterations and and change things and improve. So to a degree, I think everything here was almost completely off in uh, intuition. And and just trusting each other and, and working and in, in tandem and and late nights, and I think it was like it was to me. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but it was uh, I was happily surprised by. I, I I feel like it was a home run in a lot of ways, and it was almost like a slap in the face because the day, the day that we started felt like it was. Uh, like the day, I mean, sorry, the day that uh, that we opened, I felt like it was the day after we, the day that we started. Yeah, just thinking about it, just hearing Julian, I think that kind of was going to change my response. I think the biggest um, surprise for me was um, the 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 shock of getting it, actually being able to pull it off, and and to be able to pull it off in the in the context of 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 the Trump administration you know, just blocks away from the White House um, on, on, you know, federal property, you know, federal land, um, um, just given the weight and gravity of what, what we were tackling and what we were dealing with, it, it just seemed unreal, to be honest. I just, it, you know, um, I never would have imagined such a prominent site, you know, the sites that we, actually, we went, when we approached NPS, we had three sites in mind that were sort of on the periphery of, <laughs> of, uh, of the city, you know, just not, not really kind of in um, front and center. And um, it just blew my mind that they came back offering this, you know, um, it just, it just, it just seemed unreal. And then, and then from a, also from a more sort of, uh, you know, from a, from a more, um, I guess, nuanced example, I think I've already alluded to it, but like there was some pleasantries, um, pleasant surprises in the execution. I think this, I, I, we did everything to kind of um, make it so that the bars would not sway. We, we, we had, um, we had some, you know, some details. We were attempting to anchor the, the, the pipes and keep the, prevent them from moving. And, you know, the, you know, they just, they just, they were cost prohibitive. And, and ultimately we had to just kind of rely on a, on a gravity supported connection and, and just like allow these things to sway. And the first day that, the first day that I saw the built installation and I, and, and I saw the wind kind of swing, animating this thing and moving it and heard the clanking, 
I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, this is amazing. You know, this is, <laughs> you know, I, our, my, uh, I just, it wasn't something that we, we factored into the equation. It was a pleasant surprise. I think that's a good lesson for all of our students listening tonight. Uh, there's a second question. Um, and I, this is interesting to me because I had the, the opportunity to visit this. Uh, but the second question we have is, do you think it's possible to create a virtual reality experience for those who can't visit the installation? So we have one. Um, there is actually a, um, if you go to our, um, our Smith Group website, there is, a, there is a link that allows you to download a, a program that, well, it's, it's an augmented reality, let me be clear. It's an augmented reality tool that allows you to download the, the installation via your phone or your tablet and to place it um, in virtual space, in, in physical space. So you're able to kind of explore this installation virtually, um, you know, within the context of wherever you place it. Um, and it's, it's a cool tool. But it, you know, again, it doesn't it doesn't have the um, the dynamism um, of the of the real thing, um, and you know, it just doesn't feel it doesn't ha it does have it does have the monument the monumentality and the feeling and the weight of the real thing. I mean, when you when you go into society's cage, you've got you've got sound, you've you've got um, you've got there's like a subtle echo that you get. I mean, it's it it feels like a sanctum. And, it, and it's a really special place that has a lot of power and, and almost a spirituality to it that I can't, it's hard to really explain without you experiencing it firsthand. Um, and there's even, uh, we just worked with, um, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Julian, who was the group that just did the, um, um, the Arab degree? Yeah, Arab. Arab just did a like a 360 degree um, video capture of the installation in in um, in Baltimore. I don't know if it's live yet, though. I don't know if it's public yet. But um, essentially, what it is is it's a um, it's an eight minute and forty six second uh, 360 degree video that allows you to um, go into the go into the actual um, occupy a video, a virtual video of the, of the installation over the course of eight minutes and 46 seconds. So you're able to actually hear the, the soundscape, you're actually able to hear cars going by, people, people who were actually there at the time um, are there with you and it's, it's kind of surreal. Um, it, it's probably the best representation of the experience that you can get in, in, in virtual form. But I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's live yet. I certainly love for me, even just being there as the sun was setting, just that that magic of that exact moment of the day lend a whole another layer of, of beauty to me and understanding. Um, another question, and you alluded to this earlier with uh, the idea of something across the pond. Um, is it important that it is one singular installation slash cage that travels to different sites versus multiple instances of an installation that can be deployed and exhibited simultaneously around the country. I think I think we're on the same page about this. We feel like the artifact itself is significant and um, it it being an original kind of adds power to the installation. So du in, in some ways we feel like duplicating it uh, reduces its 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 power when you think about like the power of place kind of similar to the previous question about vir uh, virtual experience. Uh, every every fa uh, facsimile in in some ways it, it, think think about like money in in some ways every facsimile in some ways kind of diminishes or decreases the value of the initial experience uh, like even if in some senses even if you have to travel whether it be like a mile or two not thinking somebody's going to travel uh, states but uh, you know even if you have to travel getting there and, and the experience in, in traveling there in some ways, uh, in my opinion, adds to the, the overall uh, experience. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, we have talked about doing additional variations of the cube of society's cage, you know, where 
you know, society's cage is largely about the black experience. And we thought about the idea of, of doing a, uh, a corresponding um, cage that, that speaks to the white experience or the Asian experience or the Latin experience and kind of being able to experience them in the same space in the context of the same space and, and, and just what they might, what they might offer us interpretively um, for comparison sake. You know, I don't even know, I don't know, if, I don't even know if the white version of society's cage would be occupiable. Um, I don't, you know, it, it'd be, I'm curious to actually see it. And so we actually had, we are, potentially embarking on a, an, an opportunity where we may be able to explore some of that and, 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 um, and do a full, a, a, a larger uh, exhibit in the future. So we'll, we'll, again, continue to keep you updated as things evolve. Uh, another question of, as it travels, are you developing a website for the project? So we currently have a website that's kind of um, hosted to Smith Group. You know, Smith Group, and I, didn't, I don't think I really kind of gave the full story, but Smith Group kind of came on and became a, um, a sponsor for us. Um, you know, we, we, Julian and I both work at the Smith Group. We, we, we are the authors and we also own the installation, but our, our firm was very instrumental and, and essential really in, in, in allowing it to happen because they, they underwrote a lot of the, the source funding um, um, to make it, to make it happen. And, um, you know, we are, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Um, we have a website. Oh, do we have a website? I'm sorry. <laughs> I've gotten so far off the path. So, uh, so part of that, part of what that allowed us to do was to tap into Smith group resources, um, to create a website. And so, and so we can, we could probably share that. Um, and it's, con it's continued support too. So they're like, we're still supported by by the firm as a whole. Right. The AIA, the ARA, sorry, the AIA Architects Foundation also has a corresponding website for Society's Cage for the, the you know, the fundraising campaign. So there's sort of two parallel sites. Great. We have uh, it's just a boatload of questions coming in here for you guys. Uh, the, uh, the question about the materials, the color and texture of the bars. Can you talk a bit about the material, the finish, uh, manufacturer of that. Um, so, uh, well, there's two. There's two. Uh, what do you call it? Two responses I'll give. One is that we we wanted to for the technical response. Uh, we wanted to use a material that was sort of regularly available and could be recycled. And the the actual material, it's electrical. It's steel electrical conduit that was rusted uh, artificially by the fabricator, uh, Eric Groning, who's a, f a friend of a coworker, uh, Doug Bellkemper. Uh, so he was a fabricator and installer. Uh, so he, he sort of artificially rusted them. I think it may have been in the process of a week. I forgot the, the chemical application, but uh, from the, stamp the design standpoint, uh, I think we always wanted to do something that was sort of, um, had the conceptual underpinnings of, of, of legacy and the endurance of slavery. So the material in, in a lot of ways sort of represents that, that, that aging and that legacy. And the colorization kind of uh, is indicative of, of you think about like the melanin uh, of the, the African American diaspora, or uh, you think about the, the flaking of the, the rusting is sort of indicative of, of uh, trees and you think about slaves taking refuge in the forest. So I think there were a lot of like sort of thoughts that we gave on all those different kinds of levels, technical and conceptual. And also the, I mean, the goal here was to, was to kind of utilize a medium that could communicate data. Yeah. Um, so we also chose pipes because they, they have a inherent graphic quality that that's sort of capable of expressing the, those linear line graphs that you saw um, so and initially in some of the early concepts, we had, we had entertained the idea of like stack cubes or these, these stacked planar sheets that were kind of, um, you know, kind of um, articulated a type of almost topography. But, but we were concerned that those materials sort of created too much of a solid wall. And we wanted to do something that was a little bit more COVID resilient and open, um, but still graphic in nature. Um, and then we also, um, you know, as part of this initiative, 
wanted to kind of create some alignments and, and, and synergies with like-minded industry partners. So the idea of using a common building material um, was kind of part of our strategy to source material that could be, um, you know, readily available, I'd say, by, by some of our industry partners. And so that's why the electrical conduit um, um, sort of made, made a lot of sense um, for us. One of the things that I found most interesting when I was visiting the site was I've never seen people so intently read interpretive panels. Uh, and I saw people spending so much time walking around thinking and reading. Uh, so the question is, um, can you describe a bit about the, the exterior panels um, and the, the design process and the written process that went into the message there? So that's an interesting one. <laughs> Oh, well, you want to take it, Julian? I, I, <laughs> no, yeah. interesting because we had a lot of internal um, back and forth about how much text was appropriate. And um, there are people in our office who had a lot more experience doing, you know, interpretive installations um, that, I, that I have. Um, and they, they sort of said that no one would read it. You know, do, don't bother with the text. Just focus on the art. And that, that was kind of the critique. And... and I, 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 we, I think we all deliberated and we just saw it as a lost opportunity to, to be able to, um, you know, kind of give people a little bit more of an of in-depth um, um, take on, on the statistics, the facts, um, and the facts that surround, you know, racialized state violence. So the strategy going in was, was not to kind of beat people over the head with like long winded synopses of, of, of these institutions, but rather to focus on the facts, you know, focus on the numbers, um, focus on the, on, on the, on the date um, and, and to place heavy emphasis on, on, on the numbers, you know, um, you know, the sheer gravity and weight of the, the impact, the amount of people who, who have been um, impacted and, 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 and when, you know, mm -hmm. so I think that that's essentially and you'll you even see the hierarchy, even in the way that we articulated those those statements where, you know, we blow up the numbers, you know, um, you know, when or, or, you know, and we also thought it was important to kind of focus on personal stories, personal accounts of individuals who have been impacted by these institutions, because I think oftentimes, you know, when we think about these structures, these these institutional structures, they tend to, they tend to, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, uh, the the the, univ the 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 individual just sort of, sort of gets um, just gets lost in the in the story, and so we we really wanted to find an opportunity to make this personal and and really convey the idea that these institutions impact people, individuals, um, and and so that's that was kind of the. The driver, I think, in a nutshell. And there's, and there's I, I guess, just to add a small point, I'm actually going to steal it from your, from one of your things you say. We kind of deliberated, and, and you know, there's, we thought about it like a Disney movie, where there's, there's layers to this, there's layers to every story, right. and there's, there's something for everybody, you know, there's something for the adults, there's something for the kids, and we, we understood coming in that everybody wouldn't necessarily take the opportunity to, to, to read all the information. But we felt like it was our job to put it out there. But, you know, every, pe some people love censoring things, but this is sort of a, a raw interpretation of, of the facts. And it was also meant to trigger people. Um, it was also meant to, to, to kind of, you know, give, them, give some of the most egregious examples of lynching, right? To kind of help people understand the gravity and weight of these things and move them emotionally so that they could get inside that installation um, and, and, and be moved to, 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 to you know, um, share their story with friends and family. Um, so that, 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 that was another kind of motivator for, for why we did that. So another question, uh, just trying to keep these all straight in my head here. We have a lot of questions. Um, so you, you alluded to this a bit uh, during the presentation, but the question is about people who didn't support uh, the movement, how did they react to this, uh, this as an artifact and were there any attempts to vandalize this? Um, I'll, I'll just, I guess 
we had we had a couple of occurrences where people were disruptive, but nobody tried to, to vandalize it. Uh, there were a couple. There's also people who came uh, with a tone of sort of, you know, uh, they they weren't happy with it. So that it was more of a, a, a what do you call it, an inquisition of some sorts. So they they try to scrutinize the facts, but at the end of the day, they're facts. So it's like this. None of this is conjecture. So like you're 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 debating facts with us, and which is what part of the one of the underpinnings that Dayton was trying to sort of get across. Like for the, for throughout the whole process, he said everything here has to be based on facts, so that nobody comes here thinking that they could, you know, dismantle the the argument or the conversation. And I think uh, it's hard for them stealing this from Dayton as well. Uh, it's hard for some people to sort of reflect, and and in some ways, this is a mirror because it's the facts. So people are gonna people are naturally gonna come here, and and be some people will be combative. Yeah, Actually, I'm just, oh, sorry, David. No, I was just going to say, I just add to that. I mean, I, there were, yes, we, we made a concerted and a very, uh, an effort to make sure that everything that we presented um, or represented in form was backed up by data and that there, everything was sourced. Um, and, and, and there was no, there was, there was no conjecture here. There was no, no opportunities for any kind of bias and, and it, it's, Julian is absolutely right. There were people who were sort of coming to the installation kind of with these sort of ideological views and sharing ideological viewpoints and, and, and perspectives or opinions. And at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, they are faced with a fact-based installation that, that, that has nothing to do with your personal feelings. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a rendition of history. Um, and, and historical truths. And so that, that's kind of, kind of what it is. And, and, and we stood steadfast and, and it, the, the truth speaks for itself. You know, that's the, the, the truth is, is beautiful because it's, it's universal, whether you're, whether you're liberal, whether you're, you know, aggressive, conservative, whatever the case may be, old, young, black, white, you know, the, 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 the truth is, is universally appealing and, and has that, has that power, um, to, to kind of, um, you know, allow us to, to, to gain knowledge and awareness and understanding. And, and, and that's, what, that's what the installation was there for. It wasn't, it wasn't put there to make anyone feel good. It wasn't put there to make anyone feel guilty. Um, it wasn't, you know, it, 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 was, it was put there to be, to provide a point of reflection um, and, and contemplation so that people can think seriously about where we've been as a, as a country, as, as a nation and, and how they can contribute and, 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 and be inspired to, 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 to be a force for change. This segues very nicely into the next question. Uh, do you feel that the incorporation of statistics into design will be an effective tool for advocating for black lives in the future? You want to take that, Dave? Uh, I could, I could start it. Uh, I, I think, I think every tool has its uh, appropriate application, and for this, I think it was appropriate. And I think uh, it's, it, it's up to the the artist or the designer to have a level of discernment in which they feel like they they understand the audience and the context and the ability to apply whatever tool is necessary to to help elevate their their point of discussion. And I think in, in this context and at this time uh, where, where things are sort of, particularly with the previous administration where, where things were uh, uh, everything, fake news and things were like, it was, it was completely about opinion and, and bias and whatever it may be. Uh, we thought that facts were critical in, in, in the messaging. And, you know, it was, a, it was a great tool to combat all the layers of, of nonsense that have existed for, for generations. Well said, I won't even add to that. I think that was beautifully said. That was, that's exactly it. Okay, and there's one last question, uh, which is a good broad question. And uh, I'm gonna add my own question to segue in with, add into this as well. Um, but uh, what lessons learned and what how might you approach this differently or might have done this differently based on what happened? 
And the question I'll add on top of that, based on my class conversation yesterday was, can you see a location where there isn't a focus on a power reference, uh, which would be also appropriate for this installation? Mm. Well, when you say power, do you mean, I guess, is it geared like towards trauma? trauma? I guess so the, the symbolism of, uh, uh, like the Baltimore location, you yeah. have the, the police department, you have City Hall, mm -hmm. you have Moore Memorial DC, we have the monuments, uh, the Tulsa massacre. These are all sites yeah. that I'm wondering is, can you envision a, a site that, how essential are the references to the meaning? How much are they augmented? And there could be another another location that might allow people to have a, a different way of understanding and thinking. Yeah, I don't, uh... I don't think I don't think sites of power are like a nest like are necessary in a sense. It was kind of designed in, 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 as a um, obviously as a traveling thing that could sort of sit by itself. But we think that that operationally it kind of helps to to see things through through the lens. And inter the reason why I asked you that question was because we at one point we were considering things like uh, places like Howard University. And in a lot of ways, that has a completely different meaning uh, contextually than than the the mall, for example. Uh, it's almost like a, a a messaging of of it's more of an uplifting message than it is about a message of reflection and and uh, and reconciling with the past. Um, well, I'm sorry, I forgot the first part of the question. Uh, the first part was just uh, lessons learned is the things that you oh, might okay. do differently. So I think uh, it's, that's a tough one only because I think I, 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 I would say there's some things I would like to add to the, the project, like Dayton sort of alluded to it with the exhibit that, that sort of amplified the, the experience of the messaging. But I think, you know, it was a limited, limited budget to a degree. And uh, I think in terms of scale, like you alluded to at the beginning of your uh, introduction, things like that, I, I think were perfectly sort of executed. So I, I don't think I would change anything only because I think the power of, of uh, time and place were, were executed very well. And I think everything uh, sort of has its reason and, and positioning. And that's kind of the beauty of, of architecture. Even, the, even when you look back I mean, I, I don't have a long career, but when you look back at the work you've done, uh, the ability to, you know, you, you can't con constantly change things. Things aren't aren't virtual, but there's a beauty in, in history. So understanding history in the context of history, I think, adds to the experience. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily change anything. Just add possibly. And I, I think um, to that first question about would we do anything differently, I think Fundamentally, this was an authentic and timely expression of, of heartfelt activism. Um, and I think in many ways, there's, there's some things that I wish we had done better. I wish some things were, were executed a little bit more cleanly, you know, but, you know, but, but time and budget just didn't allow. But, but, but in retrospect, I think it's beautiful, even in its flaws and crudeness or in because of its flaws and crudeness, because it, 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 you know, the odds were against us in terms of, in terms of time and, and circumstance. Um, you know, we, again, we had to raise, we had to raise the money. We didn't have a, we didn't have a site. We had to literally, at one point we're told that, you know, even if we wanted to raise the money for this thing, we couldn't do it because as a, as a corporation, you know, we, we don't, we're not, we don't have the legal structure that would allow us to fundraise. Right. So we even had to like go out and solicit um, partners, you know, for the, like there was, they, you know, there would, there would, there would be time, there would be days when, you know, we didn't think this was going to happen, you know, because some, some, something would happen that just, just would, 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 would be a wrench in, 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 in the, in the process. And, you know, but we kept, we kept going forward and, and, Literally, I think we we only secured the site maybe three weeks yeah. before the final um, installation. I mean, the, the installer kept asking you know, us to kind of you know pay pay the invoice, <laughs> <laughs> and we just <laughs> I'm probably giving you too much information, but but we literally were were on a string here, and we 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 I mean when this thing opened on the 28th, paint was literally drying, 
you know, on, 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 on the installation, you know, like literally. Um, and so I, I think that, that I think it was, it's beautiful. And even in its, even in its, in, even in its flaws and its crudeness. And, and I, you know, I think to the second question, I think that you could in fact, um, uh, interpret, you could provide a meaningful interpretation um, of the of the installation in a vacuum. Um, and, I, and I think it would be it would be powerful because, you know, you, your focus would be more so on the on the data um, that really kind of drives this and, and, and makes this powerful. And so that, that's possible. Um, but but, you know, what what's what's beautiful about traveling the exhibit is you get that. Um, but you also get the opportunity to um, examine examine the particular and unique instances of, of, of localized history um, and, and, and symbols, um, you know, so, so every site kind of has, and every place kind of has its own unique history and stories that need to be told. And, and, and society's cage has a way of, of drawing all that to the surface um, and empowering people to be able to tell some of these stories that, that oftentimes um, don't get told. That's, that's a great way for us to end this evening. That's a beautiful final, final statement. Uh, Dayton and Julian, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, providing these insights for us here at Penn State, at the Stuckman School, the College of Arts and Architecture. Uh, it's, it's been exceptionally enlightening. And I know faculty and students and, and our guests have benefited from this greatly. Um, so thank you so very much. Uh, any last words from the two of you? And then I'll say good night. We, we appreciate, I'll speak, uh, yeah, we totally appreciate your support and, um, you know, follow us on, on um, our, 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 uh, our, what is it, our, our LinkedIn and our, um, and our uh, gosh, Instagram, excuse me, I can't even remember, our Instagram pages, and, and that'll be a great um, opportunity to kind of keep up with, um, keep up with the installation and just know the next, the next steps. And all I'll say, but Julian. Well, yeah, thank, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I think we, I could speak for both of us in saying that we always appreciate a good discourse and, and the opportunity to, to engage people on the subject matter because we think it's, it's very, it's critical that, that people uh, sh express interest in the subject because it's something very vivid and real and something that I think that needs a, a great deal of reckoning with. And I think accepting and having and coming to this presentation shows a, a, a level of awareness and intent to, to, to come to some sort of resolution. So it's all appreciated. So thank you both. Uh, we hope to see you and hopefully Society's Cage on the university campus, University Park campus at some time in the future. Uh, to everyone who joined us this evening, thank you so much for participating in this uh, conversation and, and sharing your questions and, and listening. Uh, take good care, everybody. Please stay safe. And again, thank you, Julian and Dayton, so very much for joining us. Good night, everybody from thank University. You. Thanks, everyone.